On the 27th of August 1940, Italy amazed the world with the Caproni Campini N1, the world's first jet aircraft. Except, as it turned out, it wasn't quite the first. Nor was it even powered by a jet engine. At least, not one as we know them today. Throughout history, some machines are regarded as great. Their pioneering innovation, groundbreaking performance, market-leading success or battlefield glory have made them legends, and they have gone on to be enshrined in the history books. This is not their story. These, instead, are the stories of the forgotten many. The failed designs, sales flops and occasional unsung heroes that have become the yardstick against which the legends are compared. Yet they deserve to be so much more than that. For in their own unique way, they are parts of history. The story of the N1 begins with Secondo Campini, an engineer from Bologna who in the late 1920s was emerging as an expert in jet propulsion. In 1929 he submitted a paper to the Regia Aeronautica, the Italian Air Force, outlining his development of an engine he called the Thermojet and its potential applications for aircraft. In 1931, Campini constructed a working prototype of his engine and, joined by his brothers, started a company called Venar, the name being an acronym for, um, that, which is Italian for jet aircraft and boats. The first thermojet-powered vehicle made by the company was a boat, which was tested in Venice in 1932. The prototype jet boat performed well, exceeding 28 knots during the trial. That impressed the Italian Navy, who began to consider further applications for the engine, and even ordered the government to restrict the thermojet to Italy. The Italian Air Force also followed the thermojet's progress, and approved support for aeronautical applications of Campini's engine in 1933. The government weren't the only ones taking notice though, Famed Italian aircraft designer Count Gianni Caproni was also paying attention, and his company entered into a partnership with Venar in 1935. This, the Caproni Campini N1, also referred to as the CC2, was the result of that collaboration. The aircraft was built around Campini's thermojet, with the initial prototype having a three-stage compressor powered by a 900 horsepower Isotta Fraschini V12. Extra thrust was provided with a rudimentary afterburner at the rear of the engine, with the aircraft's maximum power being around 6.9 kilonewtons. The large engine took up most of the fuselage, with the two crew being accommodated in a relatively small cockpit above the power plant. The cockpit was intended to be pressurised, but sources are unclear as to whether pressurisation was added to the second prototype only, or if the proposal was scrapped completely. A single pilot version, the CC-1, was also planned as part of the N-1 program, but it doesn't appear to have been built. Apart from the novel power plant, the rest of the aircraft was relatively conventional. The airframe was made of aluminium, and the plane had a single elliptical wing mounted low on the fuselage to keep its internal structure clear of the air intake. Two prototype aircraft were constructed, along with a ground-based testbed for the thermojet. The N1 first took to the air on the 27th of August 1940, flown by test pilot Mario Di Bernardi from Milan's Taliedo airfield. The flight lasted 10 minutes, and officials from the FAI recorded the N1 as the first jet aircraft ever to fly. The Italian government was, understandably, quite eager to promote this pioneering technical achievement. However, one short test flight was hardly going to capture the world's attention, so Italian dictator Benito Mussolini ordered a more significant publicity event. The second N1 prototype was to make the first jet-powered cross-country flight, from Lenate Airport in Milan to Guidonia Airport near Rome, with engineer Giovanni Padace as passenger and a payload of mail along for the ride. The flight took place on November 30th, 1941, with the N1, 
once again being flown by Colonel Di Bernardi, taking 2 hours and 11 minutes to fly the 475 kilometres between Milan and Rome. The aircraft made a stopover at Pisa, possibly to refuel, and the flight ended with a flyover of the city of Rome and a public reception with Mussolini. The dictator and his government were impressed with the propaganda achievement, but the aviation community at large were somewhat less impressed by the Italian jet's low speed and high fuel burn. Despite World War II intensifying across Europe, flight testing of the two prototypes continued. Campini began working with Reggiani, another Italian aircraft company, to create a hybrid fighter called the RE-2005R, which was to use a conventional piston engine in conjunction with the thermojet. He also worked on the proposed RE-2007, a fighter which was likely to have been powered by a German-made Junkers turbojet engine. However, neither of these projects were constructed before Italy was invaded in 1943. The Allied invasion also marked the beginning of the end for the Caproni Campini N1 program. The two prototypes were stored at the Caproni factory in Taliedo, with one of the aircraft being severely damaged by an Allied bombing raid. The other prototype was transported to the UK after Italy capitulated, and was subsequently studied by the Royal Aircraft Establishment in Farnborough. Now, Allied experts finally had a chance to study Italy's pioneering jet up close. What was the secret behind the thermojet? Well, as it turns out, it was... a piston engine, driving three ducted fans, with a sort of flamethrower at the back acting as an afterburner. That's because Campini's thermojet wasn't a turbojet, ramjet, pulse jet, or any kind of conventional jet engine at all, but rather a kind of engine called a motor jet. These engines have a compressor stage, similar to gas turbine jet engines, but rather than using the force of the exhaust to spin a turbine and drive the blades, the motor jet uses a regular old piston engine. Campini's design included a rudimentary afterburner, which sprayed fuel into the compressed air at the rear of the engine and ignited it, providing an additional boost in performance. Now, this hybrid of a piston engine and a turbine does have some advantages. A well-designed motor jet power plant is more efficient than a comparable propeller engine, especially at higher speeds and altitudes, and due to the use of a conventional piston engine, it eliminates the complex engineering and advanced metallurgy required to make turbine blades and combustion chambers that won't melt in a regular jet's exhaust stream. Of course, motor jets do have their disadvantages, which the Caproni Campini N1 unfortunately suffered from. Piston engines are bigger, heavier and generally less efficient than the combustion chambers of a gas turbine. This meant that the 900 horsepower V12 buried in the N1's fuselage didn't produce anywhere near the anticipated amount of thrust, even with the afterburner engaged. As a result, the N1, even on maximum thrust, topped out at just 375 km per hour, which wasn't all that fast. In fact, it was slower even than the Fiat CR42 a biplane fighter that first flew two years before the N1. And, to add insult to injury, the Fiat biplane had a longer range and higher service ceiling too. The maximum altitude reached by the N1 was just 13,000 feet, and assuming that it took off from Milan with a full fuel load on its 1941 cross-country flight, its range, even with the thirsty afterburners switched off, was less than 250 kilometers. While the motor jet seemed like a promising idea during initial tests, the high hopes of Campini, Caproni, and the Italian Air Force weren't realized in the N1. Now, that wasn't entirely down to the failings of the motor jet. The N1 itself was a relatively large, heavy aircraft, with its all-metal construction and two-seater design. This heavy airframe meant that the N1, with its underpowered engine, had no chance of reaching the speeds and altitudes where a ducted fan or motor jet would have worked most efficiently. And other design issues, 
like the narrow intake which limited the efficiency of the ducted fan, only added further handicaps to the aircraft's already lacklustre performance. The political climate of the time didn't help much either. With war breaking out in Europe, governments were pouring money and manpower into the development of better aircraft engines, and Italy's leader, the fascist dictator Benito Mussolini, was keen to show the superiority of his nation's industry by being the first to get a jet of any sort into the air. This put pressure on Caproni and Campini to rush the development of the thermojet and the N1, so that the Italian Air Force could score the propaganda victory of being the first in the world to operate a jet aircraft, even if it was an impractical machine powered by an unorthodox piston-driven jet engine. Still, despite the rush development and the odd design, the N1 did at least fly, and thus went down in history as the world's first jet air Oh, never mind. Once news of the Heinkel HE-178 secret test flight in 1939, a year before the Caproni Campini first flew, became known, the N1 soon faded into obscurity. Surprisingly though, the careers of Caproni, Campini, and even the principles behind the thermojet didn't go with it. After Italy capitulated in 1943, and the partially damaged example of the N1 was taken to Britain for evaluation, the Caproni Aircraft Company all but abandoned motorjet research. They continued to produce aircraft, despite the loss of demand after the end of World War II, until 1950, when the main Caproni company closed down. Count Gianni Caproni himself died seven years later, but a division of the company, Caproni Vizzola, continued to make sailplanes and motorised gliders until 1983, when it was bought out by Augusta. Secondo Campini also survived the war, and was invited to the United States in 1948 to continue his research. Not by the US Air Force or the CIA or any of that Operation Paperclip stuff, but by entrepreneur Preston Tucker, who wanted to investigate whether turbine engines could be used to power a new generation of cars, and use Campini's experience to help gain Air Force development contracts. Secondo Campini's time working with Tucker didn't last all that long, as Tucker's company went under within a year, but Campini did end up working on projects with the US Air Force, including a concept for a jet-powered helicopter, and on the prototype YB-49 flying wing. At some point during the 1970s, Campini apparently returned to his native Italy, and began studying the potential of suborbital flight. He continued this research, as well as working on a concept for a jet-powered flying car, until he died in Milan in 1980, aged 76. But what of the motor jet engine that Campini was working on, and the Caproni Campini N1 itself? Well, both of them are still very much around. The motor jet concept never really went that far in aviation, despite both the Soviets and the Japanese dabbling with motor jet and hybrid jet prop aircraft towards the end of World War II. This was largely due to the fact that gas turbine engines reached a sufficient stage of reliability and performance, so the need for a piston-powered jet engine simply ceased to exist. At least, that was the case for aircraft. The motorjet was, if you'll recall, first shown off by Campini with a thermojet-powered boat, and despite not coming to much during the 1930s, the idea of using a piston engine to drive a turbine that powered a vessel through the water certainly caught on during the post-war period. Jet skis, jet boats, and waterjet-powered ships can all trace their roots back to Secondo Campini's prototype marine thermojet, which, after years of development and refinements, has become the engine of choice for vessels requiring high speed and agility through the water, whether in a shallow lake or on the open ocean. Now, let's return to the Caproni Campini N1 to wrap all this up. When we last discussed it, one of the prototypes had been taken to the UK for testing after Italy's capitulation. This aircraft was evaluated at Farnborough for some time, and was apparently scrapped. 
However, the prototype that stayed in Italy and the ground-based thermojet testbed survived to this day. The ground testbed is on display at the Leonardo da Vinci National Museum of Science and Technology in Milan, while the sole surviving N1 sits in the Italian Air Force Museum of Vigna di Valle, a former seaplane base near the town of Bracciano. And on that note, here's a parting thought for you. Because the Heinkel HE-178 was destroyed in a bombing raid during World War II, and the British Gloucester Pioneer only flew in 1941, the year after the N1's first flight, that makes the largely forgotten, and somewhat unsuccessful, Caproni Campini N1 potentially the oldest surviving jet aircraft in the world, despite the fact that it isn't powered by a jet engine as we'd recognise them today. But really, if that doesn't make this unusual aircraft an important part of history, what does?